to actually do my powder coating, I'm using the ubiquitous Craftsman powder coat system gun. And the big advantage that this system has over uh, a lot of the other systems on the market uh, is that it's self-contained, basically. This one gun has a fan in the back of it, it has the powder uh, container in the front, and it has the, um, the ionization system that actually will ionize the powder and allow it to electrostatically cling to your parts. Um, a lot of the other systems, even the ones that aren't that expensive, uh, will require uh, you to use an air compressor instead of the fan. And to do that really effectively, you need to have uh, clean and dry shop air, which I don't have. Um, you need to put an air dryer in. Or, or, I mean, I'm sure you can get away without it in a lot of cases, but ideally you have that dryer in place so that you're not blowing moist air through your, uh, your powder. Um, it's not perfect. This is really very much a homeowner beginner kind of thing, but once you get to learn how to use it, uh, you really can get some pretty nice results out of it. Um, they're getting harder to find. They have been discontinued from Craftsman. In particular, it's really almost impossible to find the powder cups. They used to sell them as accessories, so you could keep multiple colors loaded up. Uh, for now, I've just got the one, and I have to blow it out with my air compressor uh, when I want to change colors. It also leaks. That's what this um, blue tape is for. Uh, it blows back a little bit. Um, you know, it's really not a super well-made thing, but it's definitely a great way to start out. And what we're looking at here is actually something that I built. This is sort of my makeshift powder coat booth, and I just knocked it together really, really fast out of some half-inch plywood and some other scrap wood that I had around. But it's designed to fit a 16 by 20 HVAC filter. And in the back... You'll see that I have a couple of 120 millimeter computer fans running very slow. And the idea is that this creates just, a, just enough of a um, pressure inside this box to draw the powder cloud into the filter instead of sort of collecting and drifting out into the room. It's not perfect. Um, my initial investigation said that uh, the powder particles were, were supposed to be quite large as far as filters go. They, I think I read 50 microns. So I got one of the lowest grade filters I could find because they were cheap. They were two or three bucks. I'm still getting a little bit of very fine powder out of the back of this thing. So I think I'm going to need to either step up and get a better filter or vent this out someplace else. Uh, powder coating powder is, depending on who you talk to, it's not the most toxic thing in the world. If you read the MSDS, you'll never want to go near the stuff. So I think the reality is probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, I don't like to be around it too much. Um, and I don't like to breathe it, but, uh, you know, this, this gets me some of the way there. I need to make some improvements to it so that I'm not now breathing the fine powder instead of just the, the uh, coarse stuff that the filter catches. So part preparation is really everything with powder coating. Uh, if you don't do a good job preparing uh, your part, uh, you're not going to get great results. But thankfully, I've found that it doesn't take magical preparation techniques to get uh, good results. This is a part that I turned down on my lathe. It's a little optical component. And uh, I've got this set up with a custom hanger. Now, it's very important that you're able to hang your parts. And this is a particularly tricky part, so it's an interesting one to show. Uh, there's no natural hole going through this thing uh, from which I could hang it very easily. I guess, I guess I could possibly hang it this way, but your hook has to be making electrical contact with the part. You'll notice in this case that I've actually masked off the inside of the part uh, using high temperature tape. And I've had to poke a couple of holes through that to allow my little makeshift copper hanger to... Um, make electrical contact with the inside of this diameter. The outside of the diameter I fully intend to powder coat completely. And it's important to get all of the grease and machining oil and whatever else you may have had in contact with this thing off before you do it. I've had good luck using isopropyl so far. Um, just plain old isopropyl alcohol, 70%. 99% would probably be a little bit, little bit better. I've heard people using acetone, uh, there's a number of treatment things that they that the powder companies would like to sell you as well, but I find this works fine, especially for the small parts. 
if I was getting a lot more serious about it, it may be a lot more important to, uh, to use a more serious chemical. One thing to note, once you've cleaned the part with a paper towel or a shop towel, there are quite likely going to be a lot of little cotton fuzzies left on it. And a trick I've learned from some of the professional powder coaters is to just use a torch and give it a quick pass over and that'll burn off all the little bits of cotton. Now you're not trying to heat the part up or anything, you're just trying to burn off any lint or any fuzz. Now that part's basically ready to be coated. And here is another part that I've got cleaned up with isopropyl. You can see my little makeshift hanger is holding it from a little lip inside. And I've just got to give this the little torch treatment and it should be ready to go as well. Now you definitely don't want to linger too long on the high temp tape because you will curl it. And you don't want to burn your fingers. Once you've got the part suspended, you've got to hook up the ground lead that comes from the powder coating gun to it. Now a part like this I can probably just hold on with the alligator clip, but I will continue to do it inside the booth here just to give you an idea. So now I've got the gun and it's important when you're using this particular gun, you've got to kind of give it a little bit of a circular shake and that keeps the powder um, basically cavitated inside this little cavity and it'll allow it to flow out a lot better. But it's always good to kind of start off in a, in a corner and just get an idea of how it's flowing first. So it seems to be coming out okay. I'm going to move on and try to get some powder on the part. And you should see it stick extremely well due to, the, due to the electrostatic nature of powder coating. Very nice so far. Now my box has a little handle, a little copper wire that comes up to the top so I can easily turn the part around. There, and that part is coated. And I'm going to bake these two parts at the same time, so I'm going to get the second part set up to coat before we put them both in the oven. Now we're set up basically to uh, get the second part powder coated. Now, with a part like this that actually has a concave surface, I'm actually trying to powder coat the inside of this thing, uh, it's very important to do those cavities first. Uh, when the charges get built up on the part, it starts to become very hard to get the powder to adhere in inside corners and uh, things like that. So uh, a trick I've heard from people online is to make sure you hit those points first, and then you can do the rest of the part uh, quite a bit easier. So I'm actually going to hand hold this part to be able to get inside here. can see, even despite the fact that I've been blowing in there, now it's getting very hard to get the powder to adhere to that inside ring. And, and for this part, that's fine. I'm now going to try to get outside here. And then finally, I'm going to hit the top here. Looks like that part is all set. I do like to take them and inspect them. You have to be very gentle with the parts because if you brush any of that powder off, you have to start over again. Thankfully, it's very easy. You can just blow these parts off with an air compressor or vacuum them off, clean them up, and start all over again. It looks like there's a little bit of clumping of powder in a couple of spots, but this is not really a super critical part for me. Uh, I think I'm happy enough with that that I'm going to get these set up and get them into the oven. Let's take a look at my powder coating oven setup. I have here a uh, bottom barrel super cheap toaster oven that I picked up on Amazon.com. 
Uh, it was so basic, it didn't even have a temperature setting. All it had was a switch to set which of two burners was turned on and one of the old style egg timer timers in it, which I've since removed. Um, you'll notice that uh, it's flipped up on its back. That was the first modification that I made to it. Second modification is that I removed the door. I've got a welding glove on here because this is actually hot at the moment. Uh, I've taken the door off. Um, I may eventually fix that back on, but the real key here is that I've got this piece of galvanized duct work that I modified covering up the opening uh, to keep the heat in and to reflect the IR energy back. This happens to be very reflective to IR. This is a little frame that I welded up. It's a little eye frame. It's just made out of half inch steel. Um, basically the point of that is that this gives me a rack to hang my items down into the oven. To that, currently I have a thermocouple probe attached and that's actually what's reading out here on this multimeter. And that was one of the things that I used for calibrating the oven. Right here in the back, this long metal probe is actually a platinum RTD sensor that's connected to this PID temperature controller. And you can see it's been, temperature's been plummeting since I opened up the cover because it can't maintain temp when the cover's off. But this all fits back together. The little metal lid drops in place. Now you may be wondering why I have this hole on the front right here. And this is just a viewport so I can look in and see the parts as they're hanging. There's an important point that you get to uh, in powder coating where you need to see the um, powder uh, change from the powder form to a liquid form. And this is called flow out. And that allows me to see that through there. I usually just peer through there with a little flashlight. That also came in very handy when I was using the IR camera uh, and I was tuning the uh, temperatures and I could I could shoot the camera through that portal without taking the whole cover off and see the temperature of my parts. So you can see here that I have two controllers. On the left I have a PID temperature controller and on the left I have a timer controller. These are both eBay items that I picked up. Um, I picked up the temperature controller uh, for $40 that included the RTD temperature sensor and it included the solid state relay. Uh, that was a fantastic deal and I believe I paid about $20 for the timer. The temperature controller uses a PID loop to try to maintain the set point temperature and currently I have that set to 375. That's the lower end of what um, the powders I'm using will bake at. The timer module has a 20 minute timer uh, set in it and I have this configured to do a countdown and the alarm output of the temperature controller actually is gating the timer so you notice the timer is just sitting there stopped right now so you can see this is about to cross over into the um, 10 degree range where it's within 10 degrees of the set point that's how I have the alarm configured when the alarm output changes which it just did you'll notice that the timer automatically started up. Now this is not necessarily the point where you really want to start timing uh, for your powder bake. Basically this is just saying uh, if it is outside of that range it shouldn't be counting at all. That's my my take on this. Um, you need to bake it at a particular temperature for a particular time so uh, this is just sort of the first gate um, but really you have to visually um, inspect the part and when you see the powder flow out that's when you really need to start the timer. Ordinarily you would put your parts in there, the oven would come back up to temperature and you'll see the timer count down. You'll know to start taking a look at the parts um, sometime. Uh, if they're really small parts they may come up to temperature very quickly. At that point when you finally see it flow out you would hit the reset button on the front and there you go, there's your 20 minute countdown. Currently I have the timer configured so that when the timer expires it actually interrupts the signal going to the solid state relay and that will shut the oven off effectively once the timer has been uh, reached. There's a secondary relay output on the timer module that I can actually connect to a chime 
or an alarm so that I could also hear uh, when that has happened. I'm going to probably also add a couple of override switches here. One that will allow me to run the timer whenever I want without gating, without the gating signal from the oven. And the other will be a feature that will allow me to override that oven shutoff, especially useful for the cases where uh, I'm running multiple parts and I don't want the thing to shut off at the end of each one of them. This is the solid state relay uh, that's actually interrupting the uh, current flowing to the oven. And I have this wired very temporarily. Um, I basically just cut one of the wires of the, of the toaster oven cord and wired it up onto the switch side uh, and then just ran those two wires back to the control output of the PID controller. Um, this will definitely all be cleaned up and mounted eventually when I get around to that. But for now, this works just fine. It's actually, this is a nice uh, solid state relay in that it has an LED on it to tell you when it's active. So I am basically ready now to put my two parts into the oven. I'm going to don my welding glove here. It's good to have a pair of needle nose. These are probably a little too nice to be using for this, but they're what I had handy. So I'm going to pull the top off and pull my little makeshift cover off and I'm going to grab the first part. And when you're doing this you've got to be very careful not to bump anything including the burners, including the part, any of that kind of stuff. Alright, got the first part in. and Now I got the second part in. Quickly get the cover back on this. Now the oven is not quite back up to temperature yet, but these parts are pretty low thermal mass, and it looks like at least this tubular part may already be starting to flow out. And it's very easy to tell uh, when it stops being powdery and starts looking more liquid. Now it is a bit of a challenge to see down in here with the camera, but it does look like also the other part has flowed out. It's Definitely got a little bit of a gloss to it. So at this point, it's time to reset my timer to 20 minutes and let it bake. And we're done. So we can pull these parts out of the oven. Just like when these parts went in, as we take them out, we have to be very careful with them because the finish is still a little bit tacky. So you can see them hanging down in there. Got their nice little texture coating. Carefully I'm going to lift them out. And I just have a rack set up over here that I'm going to hang them on. And here are the parts cooling off on the rack. And because these are fairly small I don't think they're going to take all that long to get down to a reasonable temperature. You just want to make sure you don't disturb them uh, until they're, basically when you can handle them uh, comfortably, they are fine to handle. The finish is well set. It's actually one of the neat things about powder coating is as soon as it's cooled down, uh, the finish is ready. It's cured. It's, it's basically ready to be put into use immediately. So these parts only took a couple minutes to cool down. Now I'm ready to strip off the masking. Start by taking off the hooks. But it was very important on this part for me to mask all this inside off because this is a precision fit to another component. So there's that part. Looks very, very nice. This is a uh, Columbia mini texture black finish. And it just feels fantastic. It feels, you know, very, very professional. Looks very professional. These texture uh, coatings really hide any machining marks. Not that these had too many of them. Now we'll unmask the second part. It's a little bit of 
crustiness here around the edge, which I can probably clean up. I've got uh, these Scotch-Brite pads that I bought by the caseload, and these are great for getting your uh, aluminum ready to do the powder coating, but they also do help a little bit with cleanup after the fact. Powder coating is very hard. It's a very, very uh, durable surface, so hard to find an abrasive that will uh, help you clean it up, but that seems to work pretty well. These uh, Shaviv deburring tools are like magic for cleaning up parts, but it seems to be a pretty good thing to use in this case because that's exactly where the little lip is left over. Very cool. I highly recommend powder coating if, you've, if you're doing any machining and you want your parts to uh, have a really nice finish on them. Fantastic stuff.